Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be a review on a Hanwei Lion Dog Katana. Now, as is tradition, I'm going to ramble on a little bit about some of the things you need to know before you hear me talk about other things. First and foremost, this is a second-hand sword, and what that means is it may not be 100% representative of what you would buy from Hanwei or an authorized distributor if you were to get one brand new. The next bit I should know is that I bought this with my own money. Now, some people think that if you buy something with your own money, you're inherently biased because you want other people to agree with you and be happy about your decision. And other people think if you get it for free, you're biased because uh, it's free and maybe you're taking it as some sort of bribe or maybe there's some other stuff in between. I don't really know how you feel. I just have to let you know I got it with my own money and you can continue thinking whatever you do for whatever reason it happens to be. The next bit I should know is that I'm not affiliated with Hanway in any particular way other than being a fan of their products. Uh, nobody over there asked me to do the review. I'm not an employee of Hanway, and in fact I'm guessing that they would probably like me to stop doing the reviews, but I'm not gonna because I have this one and a camera and a YouTube account, so... Here we go. So as I look at the lion dog, there are some general things I suppose I should note first and foremost. One, it's got a pretty stout, imposing shape. Now, it's not as wide as the XL Geometry blades from Hanwei, the kind of dedicated grass cutter to Tommy Matt slang blades that come in the XL Geometry. It's still quite wide, but not that wide. However, it's thicker than those blades, which makes me think that maybe it's geared uh, toward doing a harder target cutting. It's a large, imposing blade, so I'd speculate it's probably not going to be any Iaido practitioner's, you know, first go or first first choice in terms of doing practice uh, drills or kata or anything like that. Uh, it's got a, a semi-familiar, but not quite the same geometry as, as the standard Shinogi Zukuri style blade that... I don't know, comes to mind when you think of katana. Now, katana, generally speaking, have very similar shapes. There are subtle differences which give them subtle changes in how effective they are at one task or another, or maybe uh, what they were intended to be used for at a point in history. This is a modern piece, obviously, a modern reproduction, and I don't know exactly what it's for, but the, the stoutness, the size, and the overall blade geometry makes me think that it's probably a decent bamboo cutter. Now, some other things that I noticed right away about the blade is one, this hamon on it is absolutely cool looking. Uh, this has got some fingerprints on it from me measuring, but I mean, just look at how how bold some of this kind of choji emulated hamon is. Uh, the point is that it's it's really a very cool looking sword in terms of that respect, and that's something that seems to be common on the Hanwei HSW or HWS One S blades. They all have this really wild looking hamon. Now the hormone might be a draw, or the steel might be a draw. I'm not exactly sure what people like more, or what you would buy this sword for. It's not small, like something you would use for, uh, in, in place of an Iaito if you were looking for a Shen Cannon. It's not dedicated for tatami cutting. And I don't know how many people out there just whack bamboo with big heavy swords, but anyway, that's my guess as to what it's for. The other draw might be the steel, though. The HW, HWS 1S, I think is what it is. Uh, a lot of people get caught up in the steel and think, what's the best steel to have a sword made from? And well, all things being equal, the steel is an important factor. It just doesn't happen to be an equal playing field. It's, it's all things aren't equal. And so what seems to matter more is if the smith or the forge is more familiar using that particular type of steel and is capable of giving you good results from it. Uh, if all things were equal, maybe the type of steel would have more bearing, but they're not. So uh, what I can say about the HWS-1S steel or HWS-1-2S steel, something like that, is that uh, the steels that I've had or the blades I've had made from that steel seem to do pretty well. Uh, my favorite sword, the Hanwei Bamboo Mat, is made from, I think, the HWS-2 steel. This is made from one. I could be off on that, though. And there's been a few other swords that I've had. I've also had multiple Hanwei Lion Dogs, multiple Hanwei Bamboo Mats. I've got a 25th anniversary Shinto Katana over there. Those seem to be made from that type of steel, and I would say they hold an edge really well. They take a beating without getting set very easily. They seem to evade rust uh, pretty well as well. Uh, not to say that they can't rust, but they don't necessarily rust as easily as some of the other bits do. So, uh, overall, I think Hanwei knows how to work with that steel. How great it is in comparison to uh, 1045 or 1060 or 1095 or T10 or L6 or CPM V3 or S7 or a myriad of the other sword steels that are used out there. I don't know, but it does a good job and I've been very happy with it. This sword retails for $1,400. Now, $1,400 is a lot of money. And 
really you don't have to spend that much unless you just like spending more money than you have to. $1,400 is the MSRP, but as is tradition, you might say, or as is very customary, you can buy this sword for much less than the advertised MSRP from Cult of Athena, which is an authorized distributor, or a myriad of other distributors as well, but Cult of Athena seems to usually be the price leader. And it's $820-ish, at least as of... Uh, August 2017, or at least the time I'm, I'm making this review. You can also buy them secondhand, though there aren't any available right now, but I often see them range from $300 to $700-ish, depending on the condition of the sword, though admittedly, very rarely, I see them sell for over $500. But that's just from the, you know, the feel of the market that I have. You may have a different experience. Now the next bit that I'm going to show you is the specifications on the sword in terms of measurements. I took quite a number more measurements than are advertised on Hanoi's website and you're, hopefully they're interesting to you. You can see them on the screen. I'll put them in the description below as well. The thing that needs to be noted about the sword is that the overall measurement from Hanway says 43 and a half inches and I get 43.25 inches. So I don't know exactly where that 0.25 inch difference is because the blade length from Hanway is specified at 29 inches and the handle is specified at 13 inches. Now my blade is 29 inches and my handle is 13.25 inches. So I, I don't know exactly where, uh, where the extra 0.25 inches is. Anyway, that's not something that needs to be debated. The point is that the 0.25 inch difference is actually pretty close to, uh, to acceptable variation. So the blade is advertised at 29, I got a 29 inch blade. The handle's thir advertised at 13 inches, I got a 13 inch handle. Now some people ask why I make these types of notes in the review, and that is uh, some people don't really give two shits about, she's got headphones on. Hey, if you can hear me, I'll give you a pony faith. You want $10,000? Okay, she's, she can't hear me. So the, the point is that um, in some systems of martial art, the size that you need for a blade is, is very important. It might be based on the technique. It might be based on a stipulation from your teacher. It might be based on any number of other things that you need a specific size to practice that martial art. And if you go online, spend your hard-earned money on a blade that's supposed to fit this very specific set of criteria and it doesn't, that could lead you with all sorts of stuff uh, that could be problems. You might have to return it, search for another one, and, and it's, it's it's a pain in the butt. So uh, if it is important to you, it has a tendency to be very important. And if it isn't important, then it doesn't really matter. And you can just skip forward to the next video or not listen to me at all. But that's why to some systems of martial art, to some practitioners, the difference of a half an inch or an inch in variation is very profound, uh, sometimes even more than that. So in this case, advertised a 29 inch blade, got a 29 inch blade. Advertised a 13 inch handle, got a 13 and a half inch handle. They didn't advertise point of balance or any of the other dynamic properties or the Moto Kasane side, the width and thickness of the blade, but I did take those measurements and you can see them here. Now let's talk about the Kashra. Uh, the first thing I'm going to note about the Kashra is just how well the cast is. Now it's not a substitute for a carved Kashra. If this were done kind of by hand, uh, in the traditional method, it would take lots and lots of hours, and it would also cost lots more money. This sword at $820-ish for a new one uh, is is definitely far from what this Kashra would likely cost you if it were done by hand, just for the Kashra by itself. So the point is that I'm really driving at that Hanwei does a good job with their casting. You can make out a lot of details, and I think they do a very good job. They do a good job of balancing. I think the overall look to most of their fittings tend to eat, look crisp, and they don't tend to look overly gaudy. Uh, and I, I think out of all the manufacturers that make fittings, Hanwei seems to do the best with making a cast fitting with character and detail without going overboard on any particular end. Though that is a, a subjective and, and purely my personal opinion. Anyway, the Kashra looks good. Now note that the knot is loose uh, and that has more to do with the Ito, so it's frayed and it's come undone a little bit, but the Kashra itself is not actually loose. It's still on there pretty good. Now let's talk about the handle, the grip, the ska, the tsuka, whatever you want to call it. And the thing I'm going to note about first is that this is a large axe handle style grip. Now Hanwei is pretty well known for making these kind of very thick, robust grips or handles. Uh, I don't exactly know why they do it. Some people say they really actually like the feeling of these grips. I'm going to note here as well that the handle is not cracked. It's been used and I've had some problems with Hanwei swords in the past straight out of the box having cracked handles. And that doesn't necessarily mean they can't be used, but I would say it's definitely a point to note that it shouldn't be cracked because it could become dislodged and it could become dangerous or at least it's more likely to than if the handle isn't cracked. Anyway, 
This one isn't cracked, so that's a good sign. The other bit that I can note is that you can see along the sides of this scab that the handles or the diamonds are uneven and that these little edges, some dip lower, some are off to the sides, some appear tilted. That's maybe something that I'm being picky about for an $820 sword, but it's worth noting. Additionally, the Ito is relatively loose. I can move it around uh, kind of easy and I can especially feel it if I tighten it in my hands. I can feel the Ito kind of squirm around under my thumbs here a little bit, and that's not great. Now, it is a second-hand sword, but I've had not necessarily the tightest Edo on other Hanwei swords as well, even brand new ones. So this is not necessarily dangerous to use, but it does suggest that, you know, something is going to come loose and not be in the best shape in relatively quick order, and I'm probably going to have to have the handle rewrapped at some point. The Minuki are a floral pattern. I don't know exactly what they're supposed to be, but it wiggles around just a little bit underneath the kind of looseness of the Ito. The panels are actually pretty nice quality panels. I, at least I can make out some large nodules here, but I'm able to make out the side of the panels out of the corner of some of the diamonds, which is less than ideal. Now the Fuchi, this top blade collar here that goes in the top. What I'm going to note is the same bit I noted before. The detailing on it is really quite nice. It's very crisp and clean. Uh, the downside is is that there's a little bit of a ledge here and that could bite into your fingers if you tend to ride up high on the handle. Now the Suba or the guard on here has the same real notes as the Fuchikashi. It's very well cast. I like that it's just been blackened. Uh, it has, you know, just a good amount of detail on it, just enough. Also, this Hanwei blackening, it can rub off kind of easily. Well, well not too easily, but it has kind of a nice silver alloy-ish kind of finish underneath. So I've seen some people sand this off, and it has a, a pretty attractive appearance just with its base metal color as opposed to the blackening. So uh, I think that gives some options for customization that you wouldn't necessarily have. Otherwise, I, I think they look good if they're sandblasted. The other note is that it's pretty tight on here. It's well fit, and I think, as always, Hanwei just does a good job on the fittings. Now let's look at the Saya. The Saya, or scabbard, is kind of cool. There's, there's some things I like about it and things I don't like about it. So first and foremost, I just like the color contrast. I like that this part is painted gloss, and this is a satin kind of Ishime finish. I like the lobster tailing. I like that, you know, maybe there's another strip of, of rattan or something here. It makes it less likely to crack in half, or at least my man brain thinks it does. Uh, it's nice to grip. I like the way it feels my obi. There's, there's some pleasantness there. Uh, the Saya, the Ishime thing, I like this because it doesn't show fingerprints as easily. But this actually feels like some sort of plastic coating. And every now and again in the heat, there are some changes that uh, make it look like it, it bubbles up in spots or that it's, it's coated uh, in such a way where you can make out, you know, where it didn't suck down or it isn't quite finished as well as it could be. It doesn't feel like normal paint. It feels like a, a plastic coating almost. And I can't necessarily say why that is. Though this is the second sire where I've seen little, little bits of bubbling underneath, like air pockets trapped underneath a plastic sticker. Um, and yeah, that's not my favorite. It has kind of a crap look there. Now this one isn't too bad, but it is a point of, of contention that I, I don't like. I would have rather had just an Ishime Saya. Hanwei's done them on other products before. I don't know why they didn't do it the same this way. I also see that this one, second hand, has lots of pings and dings on it. So it doesn't appear to necessarily be more resilient or inherently uh, better at taking pings and dings. It seems to show wear just as much, except uh, maybe a little bit harder to patch up. Now there's a horn koijiri. Uh, the koiguchi is also horn and the Kurigata is also horn. The, the Kurigata is, is very well fit. It's not cracked or dinged up. It's a quite a large size, and I think this is uh, one of the, the better painted Hanwei size that I've seen. It also comes with this Sageo, which is a two-tone kind of looking Sageo, and I'm not, I don't usually kind of harp on the Sageos too much, but this is a, a nice looking Sageo, and it gradually kind of fades down and, and gives you some, I don't know, little white tips on it. I don't usually harp on Sageo, that seems to be a cloth piece that you're able to replace pretty easily. And if you use these things, they always get frayed and messed up, so, you know, and it's this nice kind of quality Sageo, I always get apprehensive, even about taking it out, sometimes they, they fray or rip uh, in doing that. So, anyway, but I, I can't deny that it is a nice, cool looking Sageo. So, the first thing that you're going to notice is something I noted before, and that is that these blades tend to have just this really great 
fiery, cool, Ochoji influenced kind of Hamon. I don't know exactly what you would call it. I haven't seen it on something other than a Hanwei style blade, at least in this uh, style. Hanwei doesn't necessarily try to exactly historically recreate something. They kind of have their own take on it. Uh, in, in this case, I think the Hamon is just really stunning looking, and I, uh, I'm very happy with their take on it here. It looks pretty bold and badass in my opinion. Now that said, as pretty as the Hamon is, the polish is just kind of one giant mirror, and you can notice that there are some blemishes and imperfections and scratches that happen. Uh, that's to be expected, this blade has been used, but uh, note that that Hamon gets blemished over time. Uh, it's also notable that you can see on this, maybe on the Kasaki here, if I can get it in the light, that there are some blemishes from Saya rub. Uh, so the Saya rattles and rubs around as this is shipped across the pond, and there are little bits of, of blemish that you would get, even if you hadn't used this, where parts of the blade are shinier than they're supposed to be, or scuffed in some way because it rubs in the Saya. Again, I think that's acceptable for the sword in terms of the cost, of, or at least what it costs, uh, but it's, it's not ideal. Ideally, you don't have the Saya creating blemishes in your very artful polish. Uh, this is not really very old for polish, and as I noted, the, the price, I think it's to be expected, but uh, it, is, it is something that isn't great. Now, it has a very kind of large, imposing shape. It's a, it's a very stout-looking sword, and the Kasaki is an O Kasaki in terms of its profile here. Uh, it doesn't show up so great in in my light, but uh, it is a large Kasaki, it's very uh, pretty, but the Yokota isn't really exactly well polished on here, or burnished, I don't think at all. It is, you know, good enough, maybe better than your average Hanway actually, but uh, at the same time, not not my favorite. It, the polish is uh, more shiny than than kind of artful. It should also be noted that the lines on it are not necessarily perfect. The flats of the blade also have little ripples and things, which is symptomatic and customary when it comes to Hanwei pieces. I can also show you the habaki. Now, it is just kind of a run-of-the-mill Hanwei habaki. There's nothing particularly special or interesting about it, but this one does actually have a little bit of a story to tell in terms of why you might want to actually take your habaki off and take your sword apart to clean it. And you can see that this has uh, gotten uh, quite a bit of rust underneath the habaki here. And it's, it's been cleaned and polished up, but somebody did that around the habaki rather than taking the habaki off and then cleaning up the blade. Now, rust on the handle is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, in fact, you're supposed to handle the sword with your bare hands and a patina gathers and protects the blade. There's some stuff that you can read about it from smarter people than me. Uh, but there are some things to note about this uh, area one, you can notice that the Hamachi Munmachi are at about the same plane, which is one of the first times I've seen that on a Hanwei sword. Quite often they are at different positions where the Hamachi and Munmachi are, are kind of set off at, at you know, not, not a parallel spot. Um, also, I'd really like to kind of showcase here the Nakago on the Hanwei. Uh, I'm going to try not to cut myself here. But Hanwei does just puts more attention in the Nakago than most people do. The signature on it is is actually not not too bad in comparison to some of the other blades. It's put in a little more skillfully. Uh, there's file markings on here, and it preserves the the shape of the blade uh, better than many. So, uh, in terms of the Nakago, a lot of times there's just not as much effort put into the Nakago. And Hanway, it's you know again, it's not perfect, and I'm not I'm not saying that it is or it's as kind of good as what you would expect from classic Nihanto, but for what it is, for a $800 production sword, I think this is a lot closer to good than I see from many companies. And I understand why many companies wouldn't do this, uh, invest time in putting, you know, kind of file markings that are even or signing it uh, with as, as much detail. And that's likely because a lot of people obviously never take it apart even for cleaning. And if your customers are not going to take it apart and they're never going to see that effort, then they're probably not willing to pay for it. So why put any money into it? Anyway, that's one of the little things that I think Hanway, again, along with their fittings, where they tend to do those a little bit better than average, uh, the Nakagos on them seem to be a little bit better than average as well. So the next bit I'm going to talk about is handling. And the thing I'm going to note about handling, first and foremost, is that it feels big. I'll put up a description of the Sword Dynamics computer as well as a link in the description below so that you can get a visual representation of what I'm talking about. The thing really to note though is that its size is, is always present in your hand. Now I also felt the loose Ito in my hand and the only trouble I could really note 
was as I threw the Kisaki out, I had some difficulty regaining control of the blade. But otherwise, it actually feels surprisingly nimble, for what it is anyway. Uh, the center of balance is pretty close to the handle, and that maybe influences that feeling where I still felt in control. Again, it always feels big, big enough where I wouldn't want to use it for, you know, doing the Ido. I wouldn't want to necessarily, for its geometry, use it to do competitive tatami cutting. Uh, but for its size and what it is, it actually feels oddly controllable and oddly light in your hand. Not lively, not easy going, but for a three pound sword, it feels, it feels a little more agile than it should. But you still feel the three pounds in your hand. Hopefully the Sword Dynamics computer is giving you a better idea of why that is than my words are simply. In terms of cutting, the blade actually performed quite well. I thought it would be overkill for water bottles, but I actually had several cuts that I was able to execute that were at least better than I normally do. A couple of water bottles stacked up, and I was able to cut all the way through them without the bases flying all over the place. I whacked the top of a water bottle cap, and it knocked the cap clean off, and the base stayed. Oftentimes that would not cut all the way through, or if it did, it would fling the water bottle all the way across my yard. I didn't have that happen. It was actually surprisingly fun to cut with. I usually have this type of experience with a much lighter blade, but the line dog actually worked really well. I didn't have to put a lot of cutting force into cutting water bottles as well, and I just found it to actually be a very pleasant experience. In terms of tatami mats, it actually, again, cut quite well. Uh, it's a big blade, and I really don't have to put a lot of effort into cutting with it. I can let the sword do the work. Now, by contrast, I have another sword that I cut with on the same day. That sword did not perform well. It had kind of a bad edge geometry on it, and it's not a fair comparison of the lion dog. But at the same time, it gives you an idea of another sword cutting the same medium with the same person on the same day. That sword had a bad edge geometry, and I really had to put a lot of gusto to make it through a mat. And the lion dog, I was able to kind of let the sword do the work, and it kind of really showcased there. Uh, my stand for tatami mats is not secured. I don't have the peg fixed in in such a way where it won't fly out. So the fact that I was able to make it through the tatami mat in such a way where the base actually stayed on my stand uh, is again good for me. Not good for you know the overall martial art and lots of people do it better, but for me that's a sign of, of a good cut or at least better than I'm used to. So the last thing that I'm going to note is is it worth it and that is always tough for me to do and I don't know why I even put this section in here but I'm going to try. So I think it's a good sword if you are a big guy or you like a big sword but still want it to feel like a weapon. So there are folks that want something really stout and kind of large that feels that in the hand, but at the same time want something that feels more like a weapon. I think of like the cold steel swords. They have kind of this large blade, sometimes really close to three pounds, and people criticize them for feeling like crowbars. And this sword is also a very large stout blade, but in my personal opinion, feels more like a weapon, feels more controllable. And if that's something you're looking for, something that is big and you're resigned to that, but you want it to also be as, as kind of refined or at least more weapon feeling, more like a sword than other blades in that same weight category, this may be a very worthy consideration. $820 doesn't seem like a ripoff. It's a proprietary steel that Hanley seems to know how to use reasonably well. The Saya has some creative or artistic type embellishments on it with the uh, extra kind of grooves or lobster tail around the, the Koi Gucci area, and it has a kind of plastic two-tone kind of gloss versus satin look. There's some aesthetic things that I mentioned before. The Hamon is really, really pretty, and with all those features, I don't think $820 is a ripoff, but that's the person I can think of that would like it. Maybe there's a martial art that goes in that context that I'm unaware of as to stylistically how this one fits that, but for the most part, I, I have really a lot of difficulty figuring out where this sword fits. Uh, if you're doing yaido or you, you're trying to do forms or kata, I wouldn't want to move this around a thousand times and any kind of repetition with it. It would wear my arms out. I wouldn't want to necessarily use this as my tatami mat cutter either. If I were doing a, you know, a lot of uh, competition cutting or if I were testing, or even as I just kind of bring the class blade to practice with more frequently, I think there's other blades that can do really either of those two tasks better than this one. If you do a lot of bamboo cutting, maybe this is a good blade, but I, I don't frankly know of a lot of folks that do a lot of specifically bamboo cutting uh, or hard, hard target cutting in that way. If you do, let me know. I'd love to, to know what a little bit more about the martial art, but uh, I think this might be suitable for that. In terms of collectors, people that want something that gains in value, it's not a limited edition. 
I don't think it's really going up in value. And it has a very classic look that I think aesthetically you could find other blades that are very similar to its kind of aesthetic appeal in, in a different either less expensive blade or something that has more characteristic in the blade like folded steel or a laminated type thing if you're looking for something with collectability or at least something that's limited. The the other groups I think of are, you know, people that play in their backyards and just do, you know, craps and giggles type cutting. And if that's the case, there are less expensive blades, uh, there are lighter blades, there are heavier blades. There's, I don't know necessarily that $820 is the best thing to spend on this blade if you're just looking to whack water bottles in your backyard. I sure had a good time doing it, but I think there are other swords that can do that all the same. And then there's the zombie apocalypse, zombie prepper folks, and I don't think that this would be the blade if you only had one and the world went to crap that you'd want to risk your life with. So uh, it's a good sword. It has its redeeming qualities. I think it has a very compelling offer to people that want it, but you just have to really want something that is that. It seems like most of the folks that I hear complain about the lion dog complain about it being big and that it doesn't suit their purpose. And that's really kind of the same argument that I would have. If you want something that's big, but still has a sense of class to it, I think that the Lion Dog is a good thing to consider. And if you don't, I think that your 820 bucks might be better spent on a different sword. Anyway, those are my, my thoughts. I hope you enjoyed the review or found it at least helpful in some way. And that is, that is all I have for you. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.